Hey guys, welcome to our last section of chapter two. Um, where we're we are going to explore phonological and phonemic awareness. So we've been dealing with this um, area of linguistics called phonology, and in phonology we deal, we study, and we deal with all aspects of sound. And up until this point, we've really only been lo looking at one aspect, which are phonemes. Um, so phonemes are the smallest unit of sound you can study. There's lots of type of sound we can study, which we're going to explore today. Um, but we started this whole um, topic by looking at the smallest unit possible, which is a phoneme. And when we say they're the smallest unit of sound, we mean that you cannot break down a phoneme into any smaller of a unit. The sound k, k, as in maybe the letter K, it's the smallest the sound can go. I can't break it down into two different sounds or into any smaller unit of measurement. And that's what a phoneme is. It's a small, the smallest unit of sound. And really, that's what we've looked at so far. But when we talk about phonology, it's really a much larger puzzle. And we've just looked at one piece. So today, we're going to explore some of the other elements. And we're going to look at it through the lens of being an educator. So we're going to look at how this applies to the classroom. Um, what we're going to talk about today is applicable to every student, okay? Um, and really, what we're discussing in this lecture has to do with all the research from the last, um, you know, since the 1920s, um, has really shown that these topics of phonology, these areas of phonology known as phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, are vital, vital stages of acquisition in order to move a, a child or an adult into written and reading literacies. Um, so this is based on, um, you know, 100 years of research. This is where we're at. Um, so we know that these elements we're about to discuss are a foundation for learning to read. Um, and it's a big indicator whether or not a child or a language learner acquires these sk skills. It's a big indicator on whether or not they um, will be successful or skilled in reading and writing. Um, when we talk about phonological awareness, we're talking about recognizing sounds in spoken language. And I've keyed or I've highlighted those words for a specific reason, um, because we're talking about sound and we're talking about spoken language. Um, what I'm doing right now when we explore this is we're not going to be talking about reading and writing. So we want to kind of ignore the alphabet as we've been doing with phonology. I want you to think about what we're hearing and what a child or a student is hearing when they're going through exercises like this. Um, regarding this topic, some children pick it up naturally, but others need more help with it. Um, so that's something as an educator you'll assess when you're in the classroom. Um, but it's something that everybody can work with, no matter if they are advanced in these areas or maybe behind in these areas. These exercises, these topics um, are good for everybody in terms of moving, um, in moving them into reading and uh, writing literacies. Um, so keep in mind that we are basically going to be mostly looking at this in terms of talking about children. But it doesn't matter if it's children or adult. Um, these exercises are important. It doesn't matter if it's a child learning their first language. Um, so my children in kindergarten or first grade do a lot of these types of exercises. Or if you're an adult trying to acquire a second language, this skill set is still um, vital to moving um, you further into the language, especially with reading. So um, we've hit this on the head. Phonological awareness is the building block to reading and writing literacies, um, but it isn't always incorporating reading or writing, as you're going to see. Some of the activities I'm going to show you can blend in some reading exercises, um, like an introduction to the alphabet, alongside of some of these oral practices. Um, but I'm going to focus mainly on how it doesn't have to include that, and it doesn't have to include reading components um, to still be practiced. Um, so when students learn to map sound to certain letters, right? So they see the letter K and they give it the sound K, K, K. Okay, that's called phonics. And that's something we're gonna get into um, with uh, chapter three in orthography. So we are going to go into how this all connects to reading, but we're not gonna quite get there yet um, in this particular lecture. 
Um, we're going to deal with phonological awareness strictly from a sound basis. And as I've heard an educator say it, when you teach phonological awareness, you should be able to teach it with your eyes closed. You can learn it with your eyes closed because it's not about written or reading or writing. It's all about sound and being aware of sound. In this lecture, when you come across a slide like this, when I pull this up, it's because I want you to do that with me, which is focus on sound. Focus on the things you're hearing, not, um, not what it would look like in writing. So I want to try to remove that element of writing from you a little bit so you can think about how this becomes a sound, um, how this is an exploration of phonology, an exploration of sound. So phonological awareness encompasses five components. Um, and we're going to explore each of these more in depth, but here's like a working definition for each of them. So we have sentence segmentation, syllabification, word stress, intonation, and phonemic awareness. Um, and all of these fit under this umbrella called phonological awareness. So when someone's talking about phonological awareness, they could be talking about any one of these five facets. And so we want to remember phonological awareness is an umbrella term for these five things. Um, the reality is, is in phonological awareness, we have these five core areas. Some of them are much easier for your students to learn than others. Um, and so I kind of have this pain scale we're going to explore at the same time. Um, so sentence segmentation, for example, is going to be much easier for a, a learner to grasp um, where phonemic awareness gets much harder. Um, so I have a pain scale, like when you're in the doctor and you're like, how bad does it hurt? Is it a was it level five pain or level one pain? Um, that's what the learning experience can be like is pain sometimes. So um, so I also I've taken these little characters and I put them on the slide with the phonological awareness topic. So you can keep that in mind as we go through which ones are easier for your students and how they progressively get more difficult. We're going to start with the easy one, though, which is sentence segmentation. So um, again, we're dealing with sound, right? So in sentence segmentation, this is presenting the student to this idea that um, sentences are made up of individual words. Um, and that sounds easy to you, right? A sentence is made up of multiple words. But at some point, you didn't know this. And here's why. I want you to listen real quick to me saying these sentences. Do you know what time it is? My sister reads a book. I like ice cream. OK, so now you've kind of experienced what children hear, which is these oral sentences, right? And this is what I just said, written phonetically. Do you know what time it is? My sister reads a book. I like ice cream. So how do we get from here where a child or a language learner hears a sentence as this big jumbled uh, uh, mess of sounds put together, right? Um, how do we get from here to here? Bringing awareness to the listener that this big jumbled, do you know what time it is, is actually made up of individual words. Do you know what time it is? And that's bringing awareness, um, that's sentence segmentation. In spoken language, we don't have blank space um, as we do in a written sentence, right? So if I'm going to write out, do you know what time it is? I'm going to put a space in between each word, which helps indicate that these are individual units. These are words. Um, but we don't have that in oral language. Um, nonetheless, this is something that we have to sometimes teach children. Now, the reality is, is, some, is it's typically a very easy thing um, to teach. Um, most children that have um, standard learning habits, so I'm not talking about children maybe with, with, a, um, with some um, learning um, disability, um, but most children will be able to get sentence segmentation very easily. But real quick, I'm just going to play a short snippet of this video clip so you can see how this is actually taught in the classroom. He ran home. Say it. He ran home. Now, friends, now let's count how many words were in there. Say it again. He, he ran home. How many words did he hear? Three. Now let's map it. Use your tiles. He ran home. 
So again, sentence segmentation, by far the easiest phonological awareness concept um, for a student to acquire. So let's progress into something that's also slightly easy for students, but a little more challenging than sentence segmentation. So in sentence segmentation, we're bringing this awareness to the fact that sentences, these big long utterances, are made up of individual words. And now with syllabification, we need to show the students that words are made up of syllables, okay? And you're familiar with syllables because you are an adult using English, which is a language you're comfortable with. Um, but to talk about it linguistically, we have monosyllabic words, and those are words that are made up of one syllable. Mono means one, right? So friend. We have two syllable words, which we call disyllabic. Disyll disyll out, but oh my goodness. <laughs> to die means two. Friendly. And then we have three syllable words, which is multisyllabic um, or syllabic. Now I'm confused on how to pronounce it. Friendliness. Okay, so those are concepts that are not complicated for you, but let's take a look at how this might look in the classroom. Listen to how I count the beats in my name. This is can go. I hear four beats in my name. If we go around the circle, let's see how many beats you have in your name. Maya, can you count the beats in your name? Maya. Maya, how many beats did you hear in your name? Two. You heard two beats in your name, Maya. So you can see this is how um, they're bringing oral awareness, um, or through an oral, oral method, bringing awareness to these children that these words that they use are made of multiple units. They're made of syllables. Um, but we're going to dive into what a syllable is a little more structurally from a linguistic perspective. Um, so a syllable has structure to it, and it's actually, it's basically like a math equation, or it's made up of units. Um, a syllable has a nucleus, which is the center of a syllable. Keep in mind, we're talking about syllables, not words, okay? So a word can have more than one syllable, and in each of those syllables, we have the core, which is the nucleus, and it's usually always a vowel. And when we talked about vowels in our lecture um, on phonemes, we talked about how central they were. And we already kind of brought up this concept that they are central to the syllables in English. Um, syllables usually have an onset. So it's everything prior to the vowel in each syllable, everything prior to the nucleus. They have a coda, everything after the nucleus in the syllable. And then the nucleus plus the coda make the rhyme. What do I mean by rhyme? Well, I literally mean rhyming, hat, bat, mat, okay? The nucleus and coda make the rhyme. Let's look into this a little closer. Let's take a monosyllabic word, back, back, one syllable. And let's look at it from this decoding standpoint. So um, every syllable has a nucleus, which I told you is a vowel. So again, I want you to ignore spelling and just think about sound. B, a, k, a is my vowel. Okay, that's the center, literally, it's the center of that word, um, that syllable, that word. Um, now, ignore the fact that it's spelt with four letters, because if we're talking about sound, you only hear three sounds, b, a, k. So literally in that word, the nucleus is the sound a, which is a vowel. So that supports our whole um, notion that the center of the nucleus is a vowel. Um, we have an onset, and remember, an onset is an onset is everything before the nucleus. So in this case, the sound or sounds before the nucleus um, is b, b, b. So my onset is b. And then we have our coda, which is everything after the nucleus. Um, and so we have k, k, k. That is our coda. Now um, we're going to talk about rhyme in just a second, but let's highlight one thing. Every syllable has a nucleus. Absolutely every syllable, doesn't matter how many syllables are in a word, every syllable I guarantee you has a nucleus which is a vowel. Not every syllable has to have an onset or a coda. Some syllable, like think about the word the, the, the. I'm telling you the uh, uh is the nucleus, but there's no coda. There's nothing after the a uh, vowel sound. Um, so you need to be open to that, that everything has a nucleus, but not every syllable will have an onset, and not every syllable will have a coda. So this word is a perfect example of that. I. I went to the store. I. The phoneme there is 
I, I. There's no onset to this syllable, right? The word I is a single uh, monosyllabic word. There's no onset and there's no coda, okay? But it has a nucleus because the nucleus is central. When we talked about rhyme a minute ago, bat, hat, oops, excuse me, bat, hat, and mat, um, we were talking about the nucleus plus the coda. So let's look at the word back. The nucleus is a, and the coda is k. So when I add those together, I get the sound ak, ak. So if I were to say to you, um, tell me all the words that you can think of that rhyme with back, right? Uh, back, lack, sack, tack. Okay, and it doesn't matter how we would spell those words using the English alphabet, we're talking about sound. And if you were to take each of those words and break it down by onset, nucleus, and coda, you would find they have the same nucleus and the same coda, um, because that's what creates a rhyme, is identical nucleus and coda. Um, and that is our rhyme scheme. Um, but let's take another step forward and talk real quick about words that have more than one syllable. So we've got the word backpack. Okay, and so I've broken down back. We just did that in the prior slide. And now we can break down the second syllable, pack. P is the onset. A is the nucleus. And K is the coda. And then the rhyme is the nucleus plus the coda. So we've got ack. So just to illustrate, back, pack, rhyme. Not because the onset's similar, but because the nucleus and coda rhyme. And we can get a little more complicated. We've got a word like coffee, right? Um, it's going to look a little confusing to you because um, you're like, okay, coffee. There's no coda from the first syllable, but both Fs represent the onset. So I want you to ignore spelling because we're going to get to that in orthography. But if you think about the word coffee, ca fee. The onset of the first syllable is k, and the nucleus is ah. It has no coda because the vowel is the nucleus, right? And there's nothing after that coda. Um, and then we've got phi, e, again, there's no coda there. Um, so that's a little bit of how we structuralize syllables and the science that's going behind there and how we investigate them. Um, there are some uh, challenges too with this, right? So informal and formal conversation. Um, I gotta tell you, I would argue that most of us in general conversation say coffee. I'm going to get a coffee. But the reality is, is the actual syllable structure should be cough fee. Cough fee. So that's um, the science behind English there is that when there's the double consonant in the middle, that they split the syllable, right? Cough fee. Or what about the word letter? Do you guys ever say letter or do you say letter, right? So you're going to have some struggles here in the classroom when you're teaching some of this uh, syllabification because typically what we say in oral conversation doesn't actually match with formal English, right? Because we're speakers of the language, so we always try to get really efficient. And we can get efficient with words like coffee and letter by actually taking off a consonant sound. Um, it's also really interesting because we're talking about syllables, right? But um, let's take the word about about. Okay, that's a two syllable word. But most of the time when we're having an informal conversation, we will actually cut off a syllable. Um, I'm about to head to the store. I'm about to head to the store. So I took off a syllable. I took off the uh first syllable in the beginning um, because we're very efficient. And whenever we speak, I might say this many times throughout the semester with you. We will do everything we can as language, uh, as uh, speakers of English or speaker of whatever language you're using to be efficient. And that sometimes involves omitting sounds completely. So we have to be aware of this as educators because you will do that in the classroom. You have to be cognizant about what it is you're, you're modeling, right? Because we want to model um, uh, not necessarily informal style, but a formal style conversation. So what does syllabification help with? Okay, why does it matter that we're breaking down apple? Turkey. <laughs> um, first of all, um, you know, we know, you and I know as educators that the center of every syllable is a vowel sound. So working with syllabification with your students helps them recognize these vowel sounds. Okay. It's not explicit, 
but um, they are implicitly beginning to hear how the vowel is a very central feature of each syllable. Um, it helps them recognize um, that consonant sounds can exist back to back, but in separate syllables, right? So ignore how I say coffee. Think about it, how it should be, should be said. Cough fee, cough fee, okay? And that's going to translate into reading when they come across words that have the double F, the double T, or the double Ds, right? They're going to, they're going to start stringing together that those, each consonant is going to get a sound, and then that's where the syllable breaks. Um, it also helps students with syllabification start recognizing long vowel sounds and short vowel sounds. So what's the difference between tiger and tigger? Tiger, tigger. Okay. Um, and it has to do with that long vowel, short vowel. Tie, I, I is a long vowel sound. We're going to look more that look at these vowels in orthography. And then um, tigger, tigger, right? Tigger. Um, maybe there's up for debate on that pronunciation. Maybe you guys put the G on the second one. But typically, because it's a short vowel, t -i -i, you're likely putting the consonant on the first syllable. This is all stuff that you're not explicitly teaching students, but they're implicitly um, collecting from this exposure to this practice with syllabification. Um, this syllabification also starts helping students recognize other facets about words, and that's one is we have a lot of compound words in English. When we get into morphology, we're going to talk more about word formation, but compounding is huge. Think about wallpaper, um, high chair, sailboat, right? Okay, so these are all compound words with two syllables, and each syllable in wallpaper can stand on its own as a word, right? So we help students see, um, see this pattern with compounding and syllabification. Um, it also starts help, it helps students recognize units of a word, which we call morphemes, a topic we'll get to in morphology. Um, and that's the fact that we have these little tiny things that we can add on to words to change their meaning. So think about the word done. I'm done, okay? It means I'm finished. Um, or it's done, it's finished. And if I were to say, the two syllable word undone, undone, right? That the opposite of finished. I have ruined whatever was finished and it is no longer in a finished state. Uh, so students start to hear that un can be attached to words as a syllable. Undone, unfasten, um, undo, un. I want to say under, but that doesn't apply here. Okay, <laughs> ignore my lapse of thinking there. Um, but they start to hear un, un, un. Wow, I can attach this or remove it. And it changes the semantic meaning, right? Changes the meaning of the word. Um, but they start to pick up on that certain syllables aren't necessarily a word on their own, um, like un or ing, er, non, right? These are all syllables we can add to a word that alters the meaning of the word. One last thing about um, syllabification, just to touch back on something with phonology. We talked about diphthongs. If you remember, English has those five diphthong sounds, like I, O, uh, I, O, A. Okay, there's five of them. Go back to your chart if you need to. <laughs> um, and we had this little brief discussion, or I did with you on this computer, that don't those sound like two sounds, right? If I go, O, O, I'm moving my mouth seemingly producing two sounds, but we consider it one sound. And why is that? Well, because I told you, they're always in the same syllable. So let's look at this uh, monosyllabic word, mo, mo, mo. It has the diphthong in it, and it's a one-syllable word. Let's look at a two-syllable word, highlight, high light. Okay, both syllables have that diphthong in there. And so you can see how the diphthong is always constrained inside as the nucleus of the syllable. If you were to identify the onset nucleus coda, you would find that diphthongs are always the nucleus of a syllable, which is why when they sound, maybe like two sounds, they're considered one because they're central to the syllable. If you have extra time, you can take each of those words and think about the syllables and break down whether you think they're monosyllabic, disyllabic, um, and what would the onset be? What would the rhyme be? Um, if you'd like to do that, go ahead and pause. Um, otherwise, I'm going to show you the answers real quick. There you go.
Okay, let's move into word stress. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is, okay, so we, sentence segmentation. Blowing the, you know, blowing their minds, letting them know that um, sentences are made up of words. Okay, cool. And then we go into syllabification. So now we're telling our students, well, these words are made up of smaller units, which are syllables. Um, and now we're trying to, now we're moving into this word stress part where it's like, well, it's not just syllables that are important. Um, sometimes syllables can take varying degrees of stress, meaning they get different emphasis, right? A little different oomph behind them. Um, so we, um, we have the primary stress. These are just tech linguistic terms you don't need to remember. But they're, the one I would say, remember, is that um, a, a disyllabic word, word with more than two syllables, likely has a primary stress. One of those syllables is getting a little more emphasis than the other. And sometimes this word stress um, can alter the meaning of the words. So I'm going to um, got our um, listening page up. I'm going to say some words to you. Um, and I want you to think about stress, okay? How certain syllables get a little more oomph and that can change the meaning. So we have desert, dessert, contract, contract, console, console, perfect, perfect. So here's what I just read to you. Notice anything about these words? They're absolutely spelled identical, right? There's no spelling difference between the two. But how do you know the difference between desert and dessert? Because primary stress, where we're putting that emphasis on what syllable changes the word. Um, if you had time or we were in class together, I would have you actually define each of these words and um, think about which one you're giving the stress. So um uh i want some dessert or um i uh, he was deserted i desert him on the side of the road okay so there's different stress going on there even though they're spelt the same so i want you to think about what those two words mean and how they're used so i have an example there of um progress progress um so let's progress and then there's progress progress same example, but one, they both have different definitions and they're both used differently. One's used as a noun, one as a verb. If you want to do that with those four examples, go ahead, but I'm going to go ahead and move on and show you the answers. So there's a pattern here, um, if you were to investigate it a little further, about stress. Remember, languages are rule driven, and here's one in English. Um, in the case where stress changes the meaning of the word, there's a pattern, and that's that when it's a noun or an adjective, the first syllable gets the stress, right? Um, dessert, dessert, dessert. Um, contract, contract. Um, console, console. Um, uh, perfect, he is perfect, okay? As opposed to, we don't say he's perfect. He's perfect, no, he's perfect. Um, Subject, that's my favorite subject, okay? Conversely, we go to the verb side, um, dessert. Um, no, I said that wrong. <laughs> no, dessert, 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 contract, 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 um, console, 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 uh, perfect, perfect, and then um, subject, subject. Right, so we have subject, it's my favorite subject, or um, I subject him to a life of torture. Okay, so word stress is super important. And I will also say that for many of you, this is probably the hardest one that we're gonna cover today because I also have a very hard time hearing it. We've learned the language, we know the language. I have a very hard time hearing stress. So I'm giving you these examples because I'm telling you it exists. Um, let's take a second here and watch a quick uh, clip of how this might look in the classroom. During this activity, the learners stretch rubber bands on the stressed syllables of the vocabulary words to help them produce the correct stress pattern. This highly controlled production activity builds awareness of stress patterns in vocabulary words, and the kinesthetic nature of the activity supports learners develop physical control over the production of word stress. If we say, 
work, work, work. If we say children, 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 children. What about provider? Good. Provider. Provider. When we stretch the rubber bands, it helps our brain remember. If we only listen, we remember, okay. But if we speak and we move the rubber band, our brain remembers more quickly. So word stress on the one hand, we can put stress on certain syllables and that will completely change the meaning of the word. Um, but stress on a word can also add or emphasize meaning. So I'm going to um, put on our quiet page, our listening page, and I'm going to read, I'm going to um, say these things to you. And I want you to think about stress. I never said he stole the money. 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 Okay. So here is what I read to you. And visually I've added the stress with the bold, right? Um, as a speaker of the language, you know that that stress changed the meaning, right? So what's the, what is, I never said he stole the money. What does that mean? Well, with the emphasis on the word I, it's indicating that I'm saying, no, someone else has said that. I never said it. Someone else has said it. Um, uh, I never said he stole the money, right? So the emphasis on the word stole. Um, maybe I said that he borrowed it, right? I never said he stole the money. I said he borrowed it. So we're putting emphasis on an important feature so the hearer can hear the additional meaning. Um, something additional I'm saying by emphasizing that word. So this is also falls under word stress. And it can be very difficult um, for students. Um, we want to move into intonation patterns. Okay, so this one's really fun. Um, and this is, okay, so we move from stress, which is that we can emphasize a word or a syllable and that can modify the meaning, right? If I say perfect or perfect, the stress on the syllable changes the meaning of the word. If I say, I never said he stole the money, I never said he stole the money, the stress on those individual words adds additional meaning to what I'm saying because of that stress. And then we have this layer of knowledge where students also need to be able to hear intonation. And this can often be hard for children, um, especially young children, um, but it's also hard for someone who, it, culturally, it can be difficult for those new to a language. So intonation has to do with the pitch or the moving of the voice across a phrase or a sentence. So I'm going to go ahead and read these to you so you can hear what I mean. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. Let me do that again. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. So what I just demonstrated for you was the important of importance of tone, of intonation, right? So I actually said the exact same sentence to you the whole way through. I like ice cream. But my tone completely changed um, uh, perhaps how you perceived what I was saying. So if I said, I like ice cream, if you hear it at the end, I'm asking a question, and you can tell that by my rising pitch, right? The question is not set up like a traditional English question, right? I don't start with do or who or what, right? It's not a traditional question format, but my pitch, my tone is what communicates that to you that it's a question. I like ice cream. That rising pitch indicates question. Okay, but I want you to remember that because I'm going to give you an ex um, show you something in a minute. Um, statements have a falling pitch. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. Okay, so that cream part, I fall, and that's saying effect. Okay, and then exclamations 
are all over the place, kind of like a rising and falling. I like ice cream. I like ice cream. So I'm raising, uh, rising and lowering my pitch all within the same phrase. Um, and so as a speaker of the language, this um, a sentence doesn't mean anything surface level because tone can add a layer of meaning to it, right? Um, I bring this up for a great reason. There was this great work done by Gumpert's in the 70s, um, and it has to do with gravy. So in London in the 70s, we had a lot, uh, there were a lot of migrant workers coming in, okay? So mostly women from India and Pakistan. Um, and they were working, I believe, at the Heathrow Airport. And there was this challenge between the native Londonites, right? So these British uh, in native English speakers of British English and these women from India and Pakistan who were, I don't know if they were uh, bilingual as in they spoke English, you know, really well, or if they were learning it while they were now new in um, London or Great Britain. Um, but there was a challenge. There was basically a conflict between these two groups. People were not getting along. There was a lot of tension perceived. So Gompertz came in to investigate what was going on. And specifically, the main challenges had to do with the, with the women, primarily women working in the cafeteria. And um, he investigated and he researched what was being said and what was being done. And he found, um, what he found is a lot of the local British community felt like the Indian and Pakistani women were being rude in the cafeteria. And here's how he identified that and linguistically what um, what he discovered. So this will make this first example will make sense to you because you speak English, right? It's the language you you are fluent in. If you're going through a cafeteria line, the British woman would say gravy, gravy, right? And they'd hold out their ladle with gravy because maybe they are having biscuits. I don't know what they're putting it on. Mashed potatoes. They're British, so potatoes. Um, and they would say gravy. So listen to that tone, gravy. And as I just showed you, we used the rising tone to ask a question. So even though they were saying gravy, it was the equivalent of saying, would you like some, right? Conversely, the Indian and Pakistani women would say gravy, gravy, gravy. And it got to a point where a supervisor, I guess, had told one of these women or the, the community of them, if you don't want to work here and you have that attitude, you don't need to be here. Um, and what Gumpert's discovered was that these Indian and Pakistani women could uh, were not using the tone of English to pr pr produce um, what they were trying to say. So when you hear gravy, you hear this politeness of would you like some? But when you hear gravy, gravy, I can't, I feel like I'm still making it a question, gravy, gravy with that falling tone, it was perceived by the English speaking community as take it or leave it, right? So they were seen as somewhat disengaged and rude, um, but it really wasn't that. It was just this lack of confidence in um, English intonation. Um, and so it really was a breakthrough study, but you can see where this would be, um, would cause a lot of social problems. So when we go back to sociology, we look at those tensions between people groups. This is the linguistic thing that happened that actually created social tension. Um, and it wasn't because anybody was working to aggressively be hostile. It literally was just literally miscommunication. So um, um, I'd like you to think about um, tone and how significant it is. And you can do that by looking at these sentences and figuring out what, how can I, um, the different ways you can deliver them. So we could say, um, what a beautiful cake. And what a beautiful cake. We could say, get out of here. Like you want me to go somewhere? Um, we could say, get out of here right before I hit you. Or we could say, um, get out of here. You're pulling my leg, right? Get out of here in a dropping tone. Um, so intonation, super important and something you have to specifically teach, whether it's um, sometimes you have to specifically teach it when it's their first language, but when it's second language acquisition as well, um, it often needs addressed. Um, let's watch a couple seconds uh, or a couple, I don't know, short clip of how intonation might be addressed in the classroom. I want more stretching. <laughs> so I want you to step up. The conference calls it 10 and glide down. Try it. Okay. More stretching in this section. No problem. 
The conference call is at 10. There you go. Because you need that. You need to use more length. So it's not always just about the melody, because you have the melody here, but it needs to be longer too. Now here, we have a question. Yes. How does that sound? Read that. Is the conference call at 10? And what are you doing differently at the end? At the end, we emphasize, but we, we stretch. Where? Which direction? Uh, up. Up. And does it come down? No. No, it does not. So we, cut, we start to go up on that keyword, but it stays up. Our voice stays up. So ask it again. Is the conference call at 10? I want you to use more, more gliding up. Use your hand. Is the conference call at 10? Kind of like a ballerina. Is the conference call at 10? Okay, so we've made it through most of the umbrella at this point under phonological awareness. We've covered syllabification, sentence segmentation, intonation patterns, and word stress, okay? And sentence segmentation was the easiest. Syllabification, a little more challenging. Um, word stress, even more challenging than syllabification. And intonation patterns, pretty challenging. Um, so we've learned those four, but we're going to go into the last tier now, which is phonemic awareness, which is quite frankly the most challenging of the phonological awareness club. Um, so uh, phonemic awareness is um, awareness of phonemes. And we started chapter two by exploring phonemes. So when I'm talking about phonemes, I'm talking about the 44 sounds of English, right? Um, because we're primarily talking about English right now, but um, whatever language it is, um, a phonemic awareness would be awareness of those sounds in that language. Um, at this stage, you know, we're no longer talking about individual words in the sense of this sentence has five words or this word has two syllables, right? Um, we're talking about all the sounds that are inside that word. And you have some experience with this after that first part of chapter two. Well, our objective through this is through these next um, phonemic awareness, um, like there's a subcategory in there I'm going to show you. Our objective when we're teaching this stuff is to help bring students awareness of initial sounds, final sounds, and medial sounds. So what do I mean by that? We can look at the word bat as an example. The initial sound is the first sound, b, b, b. And that's one of the easiest um, to bring awareness to a student. I'm going to show you more about this. I'm just introducing these three terms to you. Um, the next one that is easiest to teach is a final sound. So in the word bat, what's the final sound in bat? T, t, t. Great. And then we move into medial sounds. Um, and we're talking about syllables still too, right? This is a word, but if it's a syllable, our medial sounds tend to be those vowels. And vowels in English can be tricky. So we want to get, bring a student, you know, I want to be able to say, um, uh, what's, what's the middle sound or what's the medial sound in bat? Bat, right? We want to draw their attention to that middle sound. Here's the thing. We want them to identify all these, diff, you know, the sandwich, <laughs> uh, initial, medial, and final, right, of each word. Um, because what you're doing is you're basically um, giving them this puzzle, this uh, phonemic puzzle, right? And they're able to build and dissect words as a result of having been drawn attention to these things, um, which plays into reading later, as we'll learn. So phonemic awareness, again, is one of five categories under this phonological awareness concept. Um, students get it confused because phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, they sound the same. Phonemic awareness is, is one type of phonological awareness. Inside phonemic awareness, there are five categories. Okay, so now we're building tiers and categories. Um, and these go from easy to hard as well. It has its own pain scale. So just know all five of these are advanced for children or adults learning a second language. Um, and they're not advanced to where they're impossible to acquire. It's not like that at all. They're just on the harder end of um, phonological awareness. So we're gonna start with rhyme recognition, which is the easier of these five, and we'll go from easy to hard, just like we did um, when we started at the beginning of this. Um, so rhyme recognition, um, super easy, right? For you and I, because we know rhyming, because at some point someone taught us this. So we look at a rhyme like this, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. And so we use rhyme recognition to, uh, or we use um, 
literature like this, maybe not reading it right, but oral delivery um, to introduce rhyming. And we, and it's not natural. My kindergartner, you know, when she was in pre-K, you would read Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, How I Wonder What You Are. Essie, what's the rhyme? Do you hear rhyming words there? And she doesn't know what it is. She can't hear it yet because you're taught how to hear it. So I wanna, re uh, one, one of the reasons we, um, as a child moves into reading and writing, we want to show them that many different spellings can produce rhyming words, okay? So we, we're gonna introduce rhyming without, we don't have to introduce it with spelling. Um, but we do use it to eventually, when we're dealing with spelling, show how rhymes, um, rhyming words can be spelt differently. So these words, for example, snow, depot, go, toe, though. So here's the words I just read to you. Snow, depot, go, toe, though. Um, now these words rhyme they actually phonemically rhyme okay if you want to break down um the syllabification right with our little chart that we learned um our little graph you would find that they the nucleus and the coda rhyme um but spelling wise look at that variety right so we're building students to this point where when they're engaging with reading um they'll start being aware that certain sounds can match with a variety of um, orthographic spellings we want them to hear the rhymes though, despite the different spellings. Okay, that's state step one. Um, oral rhyming activities. So I'm not talking about reading again, I'm just talking about oral delivery. Maybe, um, and this might look in the classroom like a read aloud, right? So I've got um, a book, a rhyming book, and I'm not really trying to get the students to look at the words, but we're reading it aloud together and I want them to listen for the rhyming. So that's an oral rhyming activity. Um, the more you engage with oral rhyming activities, especially the same literature over and over again, it helps the students make predictions when they start to read. So we look at this, um, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, right? They, they recognize it, we've practiced this, we've been engaged with it. So they're starting to make predictions and um, uh, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the, guy good job and that predictiveness that habit or that practice of prediction actually will roll into their reading skills when they encounter if they're in a rhyming book right and they're encountering um, let's say they didn't know the word sky up above the world so high like a diamond in the okay they're gonna maybe pause but they're gonna predict the final sound the rhyme has to match the last one right? So they might produce sky. The prediction skills are, um, are super essential. So that's what this is going to help with. Here's also another example of how rhyme might be demonstrated in the classroom. Okay, are you ready to play the rhyming game? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Can you make a rhyme? Can you make a rhyme? Can you make a rhyme for my dime? Okay, remap. What rhymes with hat? Back. Oh, you get my dime. Oh no, it's a green one, my favorite color. Can you make a rhyme? Can you make a rhyme? Can you make a rhyme for my dime? Liam, what rhymes with mop? Bop. You get my dime! Oh. Alliteration, we're all familiar with that. This is beginning, um, this is when we wanna maybe focus on the first sound of a word. Um, we're not necessarily focusing on letters, right? We can use alliteration to introduce letters too, but let's say we're just gonna focus on sound um, and it builds awareness of initial sounds. So remember, we wanna teach initial, um, final and uh, medial and initial sounds are the easiest to start with. Um, this is a great way to allow for opportunity for a student to practice a phoneme, a sound that they might be struggling with, right? So. Here we have the, the phoneme, let's say that was a struggle for a student. We could practice, you know, this, this alliteration is a little challenging. You wouldn't use this with a young one, but it's a good example of alliteration. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. And the practice with alliteration actually helps me to practice, or the student to practice that sound on repetition. 
Um, we also have like flip phone, right? Flip phone. So when we go into spelling, we can also see how initial sounds might take on different spellings. So flip, the f is spelled with an F, phone, the f is spelled with a PH. Okay, so we can use alliteration on the way to reading to show how initial sounds can be associated with certain spelling habits too. So real quick, here's a quick demonstration of how alliteration might be used in the classroom. Okay, let's look to see what we have. We have for the letter B, what do we have? Button, Button banana, ball. banana, and ball. What sound do they all start with? Ba, ba. Over here with Sarah, with the mm, M sound. What do we have? Mouse. Mouse and, and marker. Marker. Let me hear the M sound. Mm. Okay, and with Arlenis, what do we have? H. And we have a horse, horse, horse and hat. Let me hear the H sound. Okay, we're on these last three now. We've got three left, I promise. <laughs> um, blending, again, we're progressively getting a little harder. This is um, where you're hearing separate sounds and combining them into a word. The best way to tell you what that means is to demonstrate it for you. I need to listen. What word is this? What word do you hear? B I -g. When I say b -i -g, what word do you hear? And then ideally the student is going to say, what do you think? Big, right? Okay, so a reason again that I had that as, oh, pardon me guys. The reason again that I had that as a blind screen is because that's an oral activity um, that doesn't involve reading. Um, hearing separate words and combining them into a word. B -i -g. Sorry, separate sounds and combining them into a word. Um, you could do this with any, I seem to use big as an example all the time, but I could say, um, what word do you hear when I say b -a -k? Right, so they hear these three units and they're blending them together. That is why it's called blending. Okay. The next thing we want to focus on is segmentation. So we've had them take sounds with blending and put them together. Now we want them to hear a word and pull the sounds apart. So what might this sound like? What sounds do you hear in the word big? Big. And they might take a minute, but ideally the student is going to produce B -i -g. Okay, so they'll get there. Initially, a student is going to say something like B -ig. B -ig. right? They might blur, they're going to put that vowel with a consonant. Um, eventually, they'll get to B -ig. So when a student's doing B -ig, right, and they're making it sound like it only has two sounds, but we know it has three, what they're struggling with is that medial sound which as I said, that the beginning sound, initial sound, final sound are the easiest to identify. It's the medial sound in the middle that's a little more complicated and they get there. Constant um, use and practice gets them there. Um, I, was, I have this example here about my son because again, you need to make linguistic observations around you to make things make sense. Um, we were playing I spy on a drive once and he said, I see something in the air. So it was a little, the clue was a little more arbitrary or abstract than that. And he said, I'll give you a hint. Aeroplane, aeroplane, okay? Um, and it was hilarious because it's like, what kind of hint is that? You just told me what it was. But what I thought was interesting, and so this is when he was in kindergarten, right? So they're working on this stuff at the kindergarten level um, in the Texas schools, that's, that's part of the curriculum. Um, and I, I was thinking, I was like, wow, his, he's not quite there with segmentation, right? So he has this word airplane in his head and he's trying to segment it for me the same way I would say, what sounds do you hear in airplane, airplane? And he segmented it as aeroplane, okay? So linguistic observation, um, but from the standpoint of with this knowledge, I was able to go, okay, so this is where you're at in development. You're not quite to segmentation, which was still on par. Um, below it, I have the actual phonetic spelling of what he said, airplane. So 
Um, he tried. <laughs> okay, our final one, the most challenging is um, manipulation, okay? So we've gone from blending, which is I'm gonna give you some sounds and I want you to put them together and tell me what word you hear um, to segmentation. Um, here's a word, can you tell me what sounds you hear in this word? And now I'm gonna present them some words or a, a word or some sounds and I'm gonna ask them to replace them. So here's what that might sound like. If we change the b in big to p, what word do we have? So again, if we change the b in big to p, what word do we have? And you can guess that the answer, I keep exiting the screen, apologies. Um, that the student would therefore um, manipulate this word big, right? By first, they've got to have the skill set to identify the onset, the, the first, um, first sound, b, and they need to replace it with a separate one. In this case, the two sounds b and p are uh, very uh, almost articulated the same, right? One just is uh, the voice. Um, so they've got to replace it and they would say pig, right? In this case, it'd be pig. Okay, um, real quick, I just want to show you a little bit of my time with my daughter during this homeschooling um, time with COVID. This was just a short video clip. Um, now, keep in mind that the script I'm using is actually something that school provided us um, to continue the homeschooling education. Um, but it's in I want you to take note of how this goes as an educator who hadn't done that with a student before and with a real life student. Um, also, the frustration, right? So you're gonna see, I just told you this blending, segmentation, and um, manipulation are the hardest levels of phonological awareness. Um, and they're in that phonemic awareness category. And you can see a little bit of that frustration. So um, here is my daughter working on phonological awareness. Hi. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say a word and you will help me change out one sound to make a new word, okay? Why are you videoing? I want to. Okay. We will use the word dog. D. A. G. Can I repeat? Can I write on um, this piece of paper? Well, I want you to say the word first. Dog. Now we will change out the g for a t. What word do we get? Oh, it changed the g to a t. Mm hmm. What's our original word? What word are we working with? Do you remember? Dot. It changes to dot. Good job. Like grandma dot. It does change to something like grandma dot. Okay, what about cat? Cat. Cat. What's the final sound in cat? T. Okay. T -t. And if you change the t to it, mm, what word do you get? Can. Good job. What about mad? Mm, ah, d, mm. And if you change the d to a t, what word do you get? Wait, the m to t. The d to a t. I just forgot what the question was. The word is mad. M, a, d. Okay. And if you could take the, what's the last sound in mad? D, right? Mm -hmm. If you can change the D to a T, what word do we get? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Okay, you want to do one more? No. One more. No. Tag. 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 What's the last sound in tag? T. Last sound. What's the final sound in tag? G. And if we can change the g to a p, what word do we get? Cat. Very good, Essie. No more. <laughs> okay, a quick summary. Um, phonological awareness is an ongoing thing. Everything we just did doesn't stop the moment the child knows how to read the alphabet or read sight words like cat and hat. 
doesn't stop there, it, it's ongoing. In fact, once the child um, is in that uh, kin later kinder, but first grade especially, and the reading um, curriculum is picking up, they will continue these same phonological exercise while tying it to reading because it's ongoing. It doesn't matter if your student um, is good at a category or good at one of these photological awarenesses, uh, awareness activities, or if they're struggling with it, it is good for every student and the research proves that. Um, I also want to point out that in almost all the YouTube videos I used for this lecture, notice how reading or letters like using the alphabet didn't really um, play a part in it, right? So we can, again, what I started with in the beginning is that phonological awareness can be taught with the eyes closed. There's a place to start where reading doesn't have to come in yet. When we look at how these exercises connect, um, when we start connecting phonological awareness to reading and to the alphabet, right, then we're going into, we're moving slowly away from phonological awareness and into phonics, okay? It's another category called phonics. Um, and we're going to look more at this then when we get to orthography which is when we're going to be looking at the alphabet and how writing and reading um, play into that so what is after phonological awareness phonics i want to end with this okay um, here's a practice tea question that i'm going to pose to you guys and on the next screen i have the answer but for now i'm going to read it to you oral rhyming activities are most likely to promote phonemic awareness by helping a child to learn what a Attend to the sounds shared by words in the same word family. Identify the junctures between syllables and spoken words. Recognize how the structure of words relate to its meaning. Identify spelling patterns that correspond to specific sounds. Oral rhyming activities are most likely to prove what? Okay, I'm going to pause it if you'd like to think about it, but I'm going to show you the answer. So, this is actually the answer. Now, I've got to admit, I think this is a challenging question. Okay, so based on all my um, research on phonological awareness and basically this divide between, yes, it's a bridge to reading, but we can we start it without going into the reading. I think that this question is challenging, but let's discuss why we know some of these aren't the answer. Um, let's start with C. So we're talking about oral rhyming activities and we're talking about the um, twinkle, twinkle, little star how I wonder what you are. Okay, it's a rhyming activity. Um, recognize how the structure of a word relates to its meaning. So C, um, we're, that's definitely not what we'll be discussing because when we talk about meaning, we're talking about semantics and we really didn't mention that at all in this lecture. Um, we haven't, we barely, we, uh, we've talked about structure of a word a little bit with like the rhyme and the nucleus and coda, right? Um, but we didn't therefore say, you know, because sky ends in a Y, it means this, right? We're not there. So that's definitely a nonsense answer. Um, we could um, look at B, identify the junctures between syllables and spoken words. Um, well, having looked at phonological awareness, syllabification and rhyming were two different things, right? They're all under phonological awareness, but we spoke about those as two different categories. Um, we didn't correlate syllabification and um, and rhyming phonemic awareness, which is under phonemic awareness together. Um, so that answer is not correct either. The part I struggle with is that A and D both work and neither work. Um, the answer happens to be A. So let's take a look at what the answer is. Oral rhyming activities promote phonemic awareness by helping a child to learn, um, learn to attend to the sound shared by words in the same word family. Um, so, it, it does make sense. Um, now, does a student know what a word family is? No. Have we even discussed what that is yet? No, we're going to get that to that in orthography. So this question might make a little more sense there. Um, D, though, identifying spelling patterns that correspond to specific sounds. We're going to rule that out because, again, the reason why we have to narrow down that that is not the answer is because phonological awareness is different uh, you know, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness is different than phonics. Phonics is when we start tying sound to spelling patterns. Um, so that's what you basically need to know to weed out D as an answer and arrive at A. Um, so some of the questions on your Texas exams might be tricky, but we're building awareness and over the court tenure in your program, you'll be getting more informed as well and bringing more um, completing the puzzle, right? We use the puzzle as an example. Okay.
that's it for this lecture. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions. Bye.